Okay. So can you see the PowerPoint? So like this, we can uh, fix up. Okay, good. Great. Okay, so today we are going to um, talk about uh, data wrangling, data cleaning, and entity resolution. So basically, um, so in the previous uh, lecture with Dr. Haji you, you learned about uh, data modeling, the SQL and relational databases, um, and also uh, NoSQL databases. And uh, for, so for today, um, we are going to cover um, data wrangling and cleaning, uh, which includes the quantitative or uh, and statistical cleaning for the quantitative databases. Uh, we also talk about how to do data cleaning on the qualitative or uh, logical data, so data sets. And then um, entity resolution. And also we talk about uh, how to deal with the missing data. Okay. So basically, um, so the goal with data wrangling is to get data, which, uh, so we know that uh, most of the time the data that we get is not in a very perfect format, a well structured format for you to start the analysis right away. So we want to get the data into a structure uh, form that is uh, ready for doing the analysis, right? So, and you can call it data cleaning, data preparation, data mining, data curation, or sometimes uh, people call it ETL or extract transform load process. So whatever you call it, it's basically the same thing. Like the, the main idea is to get the data ready um, to uh, perform the analysis that you, you want to do, okay? And uh, the thing is that this step uh, in the data science uh, journey is the uh, step that takes the majority of your time. So it's the most time consuming, the most complicated sometimes, you know, Sometimes it takes time for you to figure out what methods uh, to use for the data cleaning itself, let alone the analysis uh, method and, you know, modeling. So that's another story, but, you know, it takes sometimes even 80 to 90% of your time as a data scientist to just do the data cleaning and um, getting the data ready uh, for the analysis. So basically, um, these are the key steps. So first you need to get the data, data scraping. So you need to extract the information that you need uh, from various sources, whether it's like uh, web pages or spreadsheets or text documents, or I don't know, like uh, interviews, surveys, you know, all that um, data sources that you need to get the information that you need. And, you know, there are like, uh, so, Online sources are like when you um, need something like a, a specific form of data, you can use the uh, different APIs or you can use um, the open uh, data sources or you can uh, just um, ask different agencies, depending on what kind of data that you need. You can go to the right agency and ask for the data. Sometimes it's confidential and, you know, uh, it's not open, maybe you have to, you know, um, sign non-confidentiality forms or you have to um, pay for it, but um, sometimes it's uh, open free data sources that are just uh, out there. So, and like, I want to uh, give you one example of that um, open data uh, that you can access a huge variety of data sources. Let me stop share here. And it's called, um, yeah. So this website, it's called uh, data.gov. It's, uh, it stores uh, so many uh, US government's open data. And you can just uh, 
go and see like it has like based on topics you want to do like local government energy climate I mean, based on the topic or the type of data that you need or you can just go uh, in here and you see uh, like thousands of data data sets in here and it also labels with uh, whether it's a federal data set uh, or a state or local, you know, it all depends on the type of data set. And also in here, you can uh, filter it uh, based on the topic that you need. So you can just, you know, explore. Like these are, like this is only one uh, example of the uh, many, many, many um, different websites that offer you open um, data, data sets, okay? And like, you know, just go and see um, all these data sets and you can just go download the format that you need. Like it's, it has JSON, XML, PDF, uh, CSV file. Like you can just go and, you know, based on the format that you need, you can just download it. It's ready to um, use. It's very good. Uh, this is just one example that I wanted to um, show you. So, and this is just for the first um, step of data, uh, getting the data, right? So let me share the PowerPoint again. Okay, so then um, we have um, the data transformation. Uh, what is data transformation? It's the process of um, converting and, you know, making the, converting the data into the right uh, structure that you uh, can use in your analysis. And, um, you know, this is like a very important uh, step because not all the time the data comes into uh, the format that you need and, you know, you, you have to do data transformation step before uh, you can do anything else on that. And then uh, comes data integration. So, you know, like it's like, um, especially nowadays that we get uh, so many different uh, information from different sources, it's very unlikely that you can use uh, one data source for your purpose. Uh, I mean, depending on uh, whatever uh, analysis you wanna do or whatever research you wanna do. So most of the time you need to get the information you need from multiple so sources and then you need to combine the information. And then, it, uh, you know, you have to integrate the different data, you know, they come um, in different formats, different, like if it's a quantitative uh, data, they come, may, maybe come the, with the um, different measurement units, you know, all these uh, issues that you need to um, take into account and you need to uh, consider when you are doing the data integration step. So it's also, um, a very critical step in the um, in getting the data uh, data cleaning process. Uh, and then uh, we need to do uh, information ex extraction. So sometimes you don't have like uh, spreadsheets that gets you all the data that you need in a very structured format and like very straightforward. Sometimes you are given a text document or like uh, like a recording of a phone call or like a survey that, you know, they, you know, they just explained like, uh, like a text that explains all the stuff. And then you have to um, extract the information you need and make it into a very neat um, a structured format. So most of the time we, we can use the natural, natural uh, language processing techniques or data mining, all these uh, techniques to uh, extract the information we need from these uh, unstructured um, sources, okay? Um, and then finally, we need to do the data cleaning. We need to remove the inconsistencies. We need to remove the errors. We need to remove, um, like we need to deal with the missing data. If, if we should remove the, those missing information, we should remove them. If we can just, uh, you know, fill in them the missing data based on other um, information that we, ha we have, we should uh, do that, okay? 
So this is the final step that uh, we deal with the errors and uh, missing data, missing values, and um, all the inconsistencies, like whether it's like a, um, like the unit of measurement is inconsistent or the names of uh, two uh, similar values is different, so we need to make them similar. Uh, all these uh, steps go, uh, goes into this uh, data cleaning uh, step. Any questions so far? Okay. So this uh, graph just shows the journey that we should take from going from the raw data in here to uh, doing the data wrangling, cleaning, cleansing, merging, adapting, evaluating the uh, usability of data and then going the whole process again. And then once the data is ready, we can uh, start the analysis, we can uh, visualize the data that gives us uh, some insights and tells us some stories about the data. And then we can um, perform the actual uh, analysis on the data. And then it gives us the findings um, so that we can you know, document it in a way that you know, um, telling the story in a very uh, nice uh, structured uh, organized format that everybody like the general audience or the uh, special targeted audience that we have uh, can understand okay so this is the whole uh, journey uh, so as uh, you learned previous uh, lectures many of these uh, problems of data processing are not really easy and straightforward you know and in the research community, some of them have uh, seen uh, little work, some of them have been studied in depth. So it, it depends on the topic and the complexity of the topic, but you know, it's a very evolving uh, uh, research area and you know, it's uh, changing all the time. So uh, it's very interesting. So, and there are uh, so many different tools that you can use. Um, some of them we will discuss uh, in this course, some of them you need to learn uh, as you go through the program or on your own or you know so there are so many tools for um, like some of them you can just use to automatically do some of uh, the steps like some of the data cleaning steps you have to use your own knowledge or uh, like do it, do it manually some of the steps can do uh, automatically so these are the tools that you can uh, basically use for that okay so um, the data quality problem. So what is the data quality problem? It basically refers to the presence of uh, intolerable uh, defect in the data, data uh, sets such that it reduces uh, your ability to um, trust the data, the data source, right? And it prevents you from um, using the data for the analysis because you know it's not reliable so so basically uh, it's cast categorized into two uh, groups one is the single source uh, problems the problems that are um, relate relative to the uh, single source uh, data sets and the other one the multi-source uh, data sets. so we will go through uh, all these uh, uh, as we go on through the slides and what are the reasons of these uh, problems? So basically there are um, several reasons that this happened. One is the human error in the data entry step. One is um, the incorrect data. Like for example, uh, human error happens like when, when uh, people have to, you know, uh, fill out the forms and, you know, they just, you know, uh, misspell something or make duplicate uh, records or, you know, um, just for example, when you uh, enter some numbers, if you press uh, one key twice, then, you know, that number is different from what it should actually be, right? So these are a few examples of human error. And then incorrect data is sometimes, you know, you have uh, some, uh, numbers that you know from the beginning like you enter the incorrect uh, information or it's like automatically uh, enters incorrect information 
And then sometimes uh, it happens because the information is outdated and that would create uh, data quality problems. So you need to, you know, um, keep, keep in mind that, you know, out, don't, you, you cannot use outdated information uh, and, you know, it, it doesn't make your data reliable. So also when uh, like an agency does the data, uh, uh, like data entry and there is a lack of literacy skills in, the, uh, in that organization, then that would um, create so many data quality problems, like the way they uh, name the variables that, that could cause some problems, inconsistencies, you know, um, the formatting issues that all those, that, uh, those stuff can happen, okay? So, um, so these are the two um, categories of data quality issues. And so let's um, talk about the problems uh, with the single source uh, data set uh, in some details. So basically it depends largely uh, on the source that you are using. Some databases, uh, they have their predefined constraints like uh, the integrity constraints, like the, uh, the integrity constraints are uh, a set of constraints that make, make the data uh, that you wanna use uh, reliable. And it ensures the data is, um, the data has uh, integrated and you know, the accuracy of the data. So some data set that enforce those constraints, um, like uh, predefine it and, uh, Put it there. Sometimes you have to do, uh, you have to put your own constraints. So it depends on the data quality, you know, um, for example, sometimes you, you download the spreadsheet and, you know, it's very neat and clean. You just have to, you know, look for some minor errors or some missing values, but sometimes you scrap the uh, data from web pages or maybe from tweets or text uh, documents and it's much more messy uh, and it doesn't enforce any constraints. So you have to uh, set your own constraints uh, based on um, the, the thing that you wanna do, okay? Um, so the types of problems, uh, sometimes the format has problems, like uh, as I mentioned, the um, websites versus spreadsheets, sometimes, uh, like the data is missing, the values are missing, or the values are not, um, like they don't make sense, right? Like uh, when you have some, like um, a number that doesn't really look um, logical to you in a, in a category, like for example, for um, age, of the per age of a person, anything uh, higher than 100 doesn't really make sense, okay? So this is not a um, like logical value, so. And then uh, sometimes misspellings happen, sometimes uh, uh, the use of uh, wrong fields for the uh, one uh, attribute that you wanna measure. And uh, these are all the issues. And sometimes you have uh, duplicated records, uh, contradicting uh, records like, uh, and sometimes like, uh, you have referential integrity uh, violation. And what that uh, referential integrity violation means is that like it happens when uh, the relation uh, to which a foreign key refers to uh, no longer exists. Like, let me give you an example of the referential integrity violations. So for example, you have a um, data set for the it has at least uh, the name of uh, donors and then the list of the donation items that they have uh, given, okay? So if, if you by mistake or uh, on purpose delete one of the uh, donors from the list, then all the donations that, you know, it might come in a uh, like different, like separate tables, right? And then all the donations associated with that specific, um, donor that you removed, they, they are not uh, valid. So that, that's when the referential uh, integrity violation uh, happens. 
So uh, is it clear now? Okay. So, um, and sometimes um, you see that, you know, the default values are uh, unclear. So for example, sometimes you, uh, like there are forms that, you know, somebody needs to fill out and then uh, you, like these are the mandatory uh, cells that you need to uh, fill. And then somebody might just put a, a default value, which really doesn't, uh, it's not suitable for that uh, specific attribute, right? And that would create um, problems for that uh, specific uh, attribute, okay? So this uh, table just gives you some examples of the different problems that could happen. So we can, uh, we have problems associated with the attribute or from for the record or the record type or um, related to the source of the data. Like for example, when we have uh, missing values, like when we have um, a, a column for the phone number and then we see this, which is like all 9999, this is not like, this is um, an invalid um, entry, right? And then when we see misspelling, like this, this city doesn't really exist, but it's it's obvious that it's a um, it's a typo, right? And then sometimes um, we see cryptic values or abbreviations, like for example, in here uh, we see occupation is DB Proc, um, which I believe it it refers to database programmer or something like this, but you know it's not like like not like this is like a default uh, thing, but it's not really clear. So we need to make it uh, in a more clear format so that everybody can understand, right? And then this, uh, it might happen that the, the embedded values in here, like we see uh, this is the name equals um, J Smith. And then this one, and then this one, um, these are not, obviously these are not um, the continuation of the name. It's just the, it looks like um, this person's uh, date of birth and this one maybe uh, his place of, place of birth, but these are like embedded in, into one cell, which is not um, the right cell for, for that information, right? Um, and then sometimes we see misfielded uh, values like uh, city equals to Germany. Obviously, uh, Germany is not a city, it's a country. So it might uh, be related to another column for the country. Uh, and then we see sometimes like some um, attributes that have dependencies uh, and we see some errors in here, like the city Redmond and the zip code is 777. You know, it doesn't really make sense. So this zip code is not like, this uh, city is correct, but the zip code associated with this city is not right, okay? They should correspond to each other. Uh, and then uh, sometimes it might happen that, you know, like you have a column for the names of people and then like the format uh, is not consistent. So first one is like this, J Smith. And then the second one, the uh, last name comes first, the first name is like this. So this is not um, like a, a right format uh, for that. Um, other uh, issues like duplicated records, as you see, like this is the same employee, but uh, it comes twice because of some uh, data entry errors. And sometimes, you know, um, we see contradicting records, like this is this, the same real world person but the birth date uh, has entered um, different. So uh, we see that these are the contra uh, contradicting records. So something might be wrong. Um, and then the issue with the uh, source might be that, you know, we use the wrong uh, reference. So for example, in here, we see employ employee name, John Smith, the department number is 17. So nothing looks unusual or wrong in here, except that this uh, reference department exists, but this person is not part of this department. So um, these are all the issues that uh, we might face that, you know, these are the 
that goes under the data quality problems. Okay, and they are all with the single source problems, right? Any questions? Okay, so problems with the multi source uh, data sets, right? So um, it's it might happen, and it usually happens that different sources are developed separately in uh, separate formatting, separate agencies, and you know they are maintained maintained by different uh, people. So the first issue is that uh, their schema mat mapping is different. Like their the way they map the information provided in the uh, that data source uh, is different from the other one. So you need to, um, yeah, when you do data integration, you need to keep in mind and, you know, take into account that the uh, schema mapping is different. And then sometimes um, we see naming conflicts, like the same name uh, is used for different objects. Like, um, for example, I don't know, like um, you have a variable named car in one data set, which refers to the number of, uh, cars in a household but in the other data set uh, a variable car uh, refers to like a car model or something like this so this is the same name but uh, it basically refers to different um, entity right and then we see um, a structural conflicts when that we see across sources um, and the, the, the second issue is the entity resolution so um, that, uh, you know, the, that uh, refers to the fact that, you know, the same entity is, uh, it has uh, multiple uh, representations in a different data set. So for example, we have um, a single person and then in different um, data sources, it's represented uh, by different things. So in one, it is represented by the person ID in the other one with, um, I don't know, like the name or their email address or their home address or whatever that is. So, uh, but that's basically the same uh, real world person. So we need to do some um, matching, which uh, is a, like a whole different step, which called uh, entity resolution. We will we'll get into that uh, later. Okay. Um, and then, it might happen that you see a lot of contradicting information or uh, mismatched information, like, um, you know, you see that, you know, two contradicting uh, information in a one um, um, data set or in the, the two different sources that you're trying to join or uh, integrate together, okay? And as I told you before, uh, so part of this um, data cleaning and, you know, uh, dealing with the data quality issues, you need to do manually and you use your own uh, knowledge, but part of it can be automatically done. And these are a few uh, tools and software that uh, you can use. Uh, I mean, I just listed a few of them for you. Uh, and this article that I linked here shows, it says the, uh, the eight best data quality tools and software for 2022. You can um, go and just read uh, through the list. It explains why and how these are uh, the best data quality tools now. And you can, you can use to at least uh, automate part of the data cleaning process using all these tools. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with any of the things that listed here. Oh, okay. So which one have you worked with before? A little bit of Oracle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I... Okay. So, um, so the first uh, thing that we want to talk about is how to um, do the quantitative or uh, statistical cleaning. Uh, 
basically cleaning the data on the uh, quantitative um, data sources, okay? And um, there is this article that I have linked and uh, most of the stuff that I'm covering today uh, related to this topic, the data cleaning on the quantitative uh, data sets comes from this uh, article by, it was written by Joe Hellerstein from UC Berkeley. And it has a, it has a very good uh, information on uh, data cleaning for la large um, databases. Uh, so basically it first gives a brief discussion of the general pro problems of data cleaning. And then, uh, uh, but it primarily focuses on the quantitative data, the, uh, the data that comes with um, numbers or measurements and, you know, uh, basically quantitative data sets. Um, and part of the material that I covered today comes from this article, Outlier Detection, Principles, Techniques, and Applications by Shala and Sun. Um, and this is also linked so you can uh, read the, the entire um, uh, you can read the entire article um, later. So, um, so um, first thing uh, is the sources of errors in the quantitative data. So basically, uh, the first thing happens when you do uh, the data entry, right? So sometimes the data entry is uh, done manually and, uh, and sometimes, you know, it's just, you know, some data or surveys or forms that they need to fill out. And, you know, uh, sometimes they just put um, some arbitrary values to just uh, fill out that cell, but it's not actually true. So, uh, and these are the errors that, you know, they are not really straightforward to catch, but they're, they uh, basically exist. Or sometimes, you know, um, at the data, data entry stage, sometimes you just misspell, as I mentioned, or, you know, uh, put wrong uh, numbers there. Um, and then we have measurement errors. Um, so, for example, like you have um, a data on the vehicle speed or a data on, um, population groups, like different groups of population. And, you know, it all, uh, you know, you have to measure something and then you have to put it there, like the vehicle speed, you have to measure it first uh, and then put it there. Um, even if it's automatically done, maybe the sensor um, does something wrong or is not uh, functioning good. Or maybe like if you do, uh, if you use some tools to enter the data, maybe, um, you kind of don't know how to use the tool and you know make you make some mistakes at the data entry uh, step or you know sometimes you just like those who do the data entry they just don't they don't have enough knowledge you know all these errors happen uh, with the like the when they have to measure something and then put the value uh, into the data set, okay and that is called measurement error and then we have uh, distillation error, which happens when um, sometimes you have very large data sets that you just want to refine it and um, basically, you know, summarize it or doing some uh, early processing or pre-processing before you um, use or present the actual data set. So, and some errors might happen at that stage. So this is called the distillation error, distillation error. Um, and then um, we have the data integration errors that, you know, you might, uh, some inconsistent, inconsistencies happen when um, you combine two different data sources or across uh, multiple data sources, you know, um, that's when, you know, when you do data integration, those errors happen. So these are all the different uh, sources of errors. And, right. Okay. 
So basically the main um, step in the quantitative data uh, cleaning is catching, identifying, and um, basically fixing outliers, right? So, um, and there are ways uh, we can detect the outliers. So for example, this, uh, look at these numbers. They come from, like this is a, a data, data set that uh, it lists the age of uh, employees in a, a particular company. And uh, the mean for this is uh, 59 and the standard deviation is 96. So, so we know that uh, one of the ways to detect and identify outliers in a specific data is um, using the uh, descriptive statistics, like the measures like center, like mean, or measure of dispersion, like standard deviation. And that's, uh, that's when we want to detect uh, univariate outliers. Like we want to detect the outliers in a single column, in a single attribute. Right, and in here, by just uh, looking the numbers, we can say which numbers are outliers, right? Because like um, like someone age fourteen or thirteen or twelve cannot be an employee; it's illegal, right? Uh, someone age four uh, four hundred fifty, like we don't have like uh, the human life expectancy is not. Uh, that high, right? So by just looking, we know that these numbers are outliers, but the thing is that the computers don't know. The computers don't have such knowledge. Um, and we need to you know, find ways that the computers can easily and uh, accurately detect uh, these outliers, okay? So one way is to use the mean and standard deviation. So basically we can say, okay, um, like anything that falls within the um, two standard deviation um, away from the mean that uh, we consider as outlier, okay? And that's one way. But sometimes, you know, that, um, that method works and it's perfect. Sometimes it doesn't work and we need to find um, other ways, like other more advanced ways. One of those ways is to use uh, robust statistics instead of just the regular uh, mean and standard deviation. We can use uh, other uh, measures. For example, one thing that we can use is uh, using the median or like K percent um, trimmed mean, which basically says you should discard the lowest and highest K percent uh, of the values so that uh, anything that remains is like free of any outliers, okay? Um, and another thing uh, is to use uh, robust dispersion, which uh, something we have a uh, measure, it's called median absolute deviation or MAD. So it basically measures the median distance from all the var values from the median value. And there's a formula for that. You can just give the formula um, and just code it in uh, SQL or Python. They can, you can easily uh, calculate it and you know just uh, use it for detecting the outliers, right? Um, yeah. Uh, something that I wanted to like. Uh, Something that happens when we like use uh, regular mean or standard deviation and use the very uh, basic method is that um, you that like you mask some of the outliers, like uh, you uh, calculate that uh, like range, and then some of the outliers um, still are in the range of acceptable values. But in the reality, we know that for example, fourteen. Uh, is like an outlier in here, right? Um, another uh, way that we can, oh, yeah, something that I wanted to tell you in here that why 
using median is in here is better than using the mean. Any guesses? Can you guess why using the robust uh, statistics like using the median um, in this case is better than using the mean and standard deviation and um, basically calculating the range using the two standard deviation away from the mean. Because it better accounts for the outliers. Yeah, but how? How that happens? Uh, by getting rid of the the outliers, um, the the mean will be more representative of um, the the bulk of everything that's in there. Okay. Uh, yeah. So one thing that I wanted to you to notice in here is that like mean is a value that is largely dependent on the uh, values. Like you have this outlier, if this was, like imagine what happens to the mean if this was uh, 4,500 instead of four, uh, 450. Like just by mistake, somebody just put two zeros there and didn't notice. So what happens to the mean? You know, it basically ruins everything, right? But the median is different. Like the median doesn't really change uh, when you remove the outliers. So the median is something like if you, for example, in here, let's say we have 450 here, which most likely it, it had been uh, 45. So this zero is just extra that somebody did just uh, put there. So 45. And then this one might have been 21, this one might have been 31, and this one might have been 41 instead of 14, right? And then once we correct all these, so like the, what they, they mean would change um, dramatically, but the median is something that really doesn't change. The median is something be, uh, between these two, either it's uh, 37 or 39. So it doesn't really change. So that's why uh, we, are, we can rely on the median. Um, most of the time, like it's a, it's a better measure. But I mean, saying all that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, using mean and standard deviation is not a, uh, is not a good uh, method. But just, you know, you should, you know, just keep in mind that these are the different uh, approaches that sometimes, you know, one might work better than the other or vice versa. Okay. Um, and there is a, another approach to find outliers is this is called, this was um, basically proposed by somebody called uh, Hampel and it's called Hampel X84. And basically it says any data points that is 1.4826X uh, uh, mat away from the median, we call it or we identify it as outlier. Okay, um, but everything that I mentioned here uh, is true when the assumption of uh, being normally distributed with the data uh, is true. So if that assumption is not true, then we need to, you know, uh, discover um, and explore other uh, methods, right? Um, so basically in here, let me show you that um, if we use this one, this is the range. So anything outside this range, um, which is two uh, standard deviation of, uh, from the mean is from the median uh, is called outlier. But um, yeah. So this one doesn't capture this outlier. Oh, basically, yeah, it captures, right? Yeah. But then uh, when we when we use uh, like a different, uh, the second one, it just uses uh, one standard deviation. 
we get this range and it's much better uh, than what, what we get uh, with the mean, right? I have a question regarding sure. this. Okay. Um, it says like, assuming we use two standard deviations, mm -hmm. but standard deviation is like based on the mean. So yes. if the mean is mean is based on the outlier, then isn't like this um, method affected by the outliers already? Because the mean, uh, to find the standard deviation, we're using the data that contains the outliers. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I mean, that's why I said, you know, sometimes, uh, so basically, um, you know, the normal, uh, like that's why we say the normal distribution assumption uh, should be uh, here. Because the normal distribution assumes that uh, the mean is zero and the uh, standard deviation is one, right? So oh, if it's not if it's yeah. not normal, if it's not normally distributed, then we need to explore other methods. And you know, I mean, uh, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about like. Uh, how do we deal with non-normally distributed uh, data? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and, uh, so, uh, and these are all you, you can do with uh, SQL, and this is uh, part of the code that you can calculate the, all these uh, values, the median, and also in Python, you can uh, do it. Um, so sometimes, you know, like in a uh, reasonably sized data set, you can just use uh, and calculate median easily in Python, but sometimes it's very large. It takes uh, like the uh, computation time goes very high. You can use approximate median instead. So this is just something that uh, I wanted to mention. And uh, okay. So, and then uh, this Wikipedia article that I linked here is uh, list all the uh, all the types of outliers and how, I mean, uh, all the tests that you can use to detect the outliers. And now uh, that goes to your question, what, what if the data is not normally distributed? Uh, and there's, th this happens uh, very frequently that our data is not normally distributed. So the first uh, option, as it uh, comes in that um, article that I said, the first option that he suggests is to just ignore the non-normality and just um, treat it as a normally based uh, data and just you know detect the outliers with all those um, uh, techniques that we have. Uh, but we should know that sometimes it should uh, Sometimes it works and sometimes it really doesn't work. Uh, there are some uh, validation tests after we, we detect the outlier so that we know that, you know, if that uh, technique works good or not, okay? Uh, and option two is to partition the data and split it into subsets of data and that are uh, basically normally distributed and then uh, detect the outliers uh, on those subsets uh, separately. And this might uh, work in some cases, but again, uh, this is not like the best approach because sometimes you might uh, detect the outliers by mistake that, you know, they are not actually uh, outliers because, you know, you, you use the subsets, not the whole thing. And yeah, this one has some, uh, errors too, but this is something that you know it has been uh, proposed and it has has been used before. Um, option three is to use uh, some non-parametric approaches. Uh, one is to use distance-based approach. One is to use density-based. So with the distance-based, uh, you basically look for data points that uh, do not have many neighbors. So either you can use um, some uh, measuring uh, steps, or you can just visualize it and you can see that, you know, uh, detect those that don't have uh, many neighboring points. 
you can just uh, identify them as outliers. So this is this distance based. And then we have uh, density based. So with the density, uh, we define density to be the average distance to the k uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, and then we, we define the relative density as the density of that node uh, over the average density of its neighbors. And then uh, we use that rel relative density to decide if the node is an outlier or not, okay? So these are, um, I guess, more advanced and more, I mean, we can use it on more complicated cases. Uh, these are the non-parametric approaches. Um, okay, so how about if, I mean, we talked about the univariate outliers when we wanna detect the outliers on a, a single column or single attribute. Uh, how about if we wanna detect the outliers on a, on, on a multivariate space when we um, wanna consider multiple attributes at once and detect the outliers. So for example, um, Let's say that, um, okay, so we know that uh, a household income should not be less than the household um, expenditure, right? And suppose that we have a data set that uh, it has observations like households from different countries and, um, and then you know, in different countries, the income is different, the expenditure is different. So if you look at the income uh, by itself, if you treat it as a, a univariate uh, outlier, you want to use those techniques, nothing might come up as outlier because, you know, you see a range of numbers uh, and, you know, uh, nothing um, looks unusual. But if you consider if you uh, consider both of them together, and if you consider like the, the countries that uh, that household uh, belongs to, then uh, you see that okay, if uh, the expenditure is higher than uh, the income, this number might not be uh, a true number. This might be a mistake or an outlier. Okay. Uh, so. Again, uh, similar to the univariate, we have a set of techniques to uh, identify the outliers. We can use uh, mean, uh, mean and covariance matrix in here. Uh, there is the uh, index, it's called uh, Mahalanobis depth of a point, which is a square root of uh, X minus mu uh, and then sigma inverse uh, of the X minus uh, mu. So this is the formula to calculate this uh, value. And then uh, it basically measures how far the point X is um, from the multivariate normal uh, distribution, okay? And uh, look for the points that are uh, too far away and you know, it just detects uh, as outlier, okay? Um, and as you uh, mentioned, uh, Again, a mean and covariance are not robust because they are sensitive uh, to outliers, as you mentioned. So in here, um, we can uh, use iterative approach. We can uh, remove the points with high uh, this value, the Mahalanobis uh, distance, and then recompute the mean and covariance and then do it again until we uh, are confident and are satisfied with the all the outliers that we have detected. So, um, and then uh, in that article that I mentioned, uh, several other approaches are discussed. You can uh, read for your own reference. Uh, we don't really have time to cover all of them in class, but it's this is a very good article. So I, I strongly um, encourage you to go and read it. Um, and, but um, you should know that, you know, there is no clear guidelines here. It's like you should, uh, again, this is when you should uh, involve your own judgment. You should try different techniques based on the data that you have and then see which one works uh, the best depending on the, the nature of the data and you know, um, the ranges and so on. 
बात है या सो इन हियर इट जस्ट शोज यू हाउ द महालानोबिस डिस्टेंस इज डिफरेंट फ्रॉम द यूक्लिडियन डिस्टेंस सो लेट्स लुक एट दिस पेयर्स लाइक द 29 and 14 and then um, the second one is 61 and 16 so if you look at this uh, value is much less than the euclidean distance between the two points and again with the second one it's uh, also smaller and it's different so you can just see the difference uh, of um, that index as it represents that like how um, far away are they are from the uh, yeah. and uh, this is another example that I wanted to show you so this data set uh, basically they have done like you can see that it comes into two clusters of data points cluster one and cluster two and uh, these three points are uh, identified as outliers okay so but you know if if we like make errors and if we make mistakes in here uh, it might be possible that you know we identify all of these as outliers because if we ju just consider this part of the data like you know then that uh, that mistake happens okay so we need to be careful about all these errors and this is just another example i just wanted to um you see the outliers here Okay, so other outliers. Um, so in the in a time series uh, data set that, um, so for example, in the time series, we have one observation that we have information associated one, with uh, a single observation in different time stamp, time stamps. And then um, it's, it's kind of tricky how, how we detect the outliers in the time series data. Uh, and there's a, a rich uh, literature on that. Uh, it has been studied a lot. And, you know, basically um, the, the most basic method that you can use is to use uh, the historical values or the patterns in the uh, data points uh, to basically identify and detect the outliers. Okay, but it's different. Like just wanted to, you know, um, point that you know different data sets uh, have different outliers and different methods to detect them and um, also frequency based outliers this refers to the fact that you know sometimes um, the value of the um, that cell is not as important as the frequency uh, of that happening right so sometimes you know this um, sometimes a value uh, is repeated like so many times and much, it's much more frequent than other uh, values in the data that we call it a heavy hitter and uh, it's important to identify those heavy hitters and see if they are considered outliers or not right and uh, in relational databases you can just use a simple uh, group by count and you can uh, detect those heavy hitters uh, using that uh, function and then, you know, you can just see the outliers in there. Okay, and and then um, again, as I said, um, things are not uh, generally straightforward with this. Uh, so many other types of data, and you know, the outlier detection is very tricky. 
uh, and it's a very like it's a major research area and still so many uh, researchers are interested in working on different methods to detect the outliers with uh, minimized errors in the process okay okay so um next we want to talk about uh, data cleaning on the qualitative data okay so um in the uh, qualitative data cleaning basically um you need to put some constraints uh, on the data to identify the errors and that would require uh, at least some uh, domain knowledge but uh, you know you can automate part of it but still you need some uh, domain knowledge uh, so similar i mean there are examples that i can uh, give it to you like basically um, the example that you know those numbers that we just saw um, when you first look at the data by your own uh, domain knowledge, you can basically tell um, all the outliers without any mistake, right? And, you know, that was, uh, that wasn't a qualitative um, data, but I'm just, you know, giving an example, like in the qualitative data, like sometimes uh, it's easier um, to, you know, use your own knowledge to put the constraints and then, um, you know, detect the outlayer. So we will see some examples uh, in the in the next slides. Okay, uh, but it's it's tricky to put the constraints and it's tricky to put them uh, efficiently so that you um, uh, detect all the outliers or as as many outliers as uh, there is. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's look at this uh, example. In here, uh, we see some uh, functional dependencies, which says that uh, in here, uh, if two tuples have the same value for A, they must have uh, the same value for attribute B. What does it mean is that, for example, if this person uh, lives in New York City, then the state should be New York. And so then this person, like this uh, here, is an error that we need to fix. Okay. So first uh, is the functional dependencies that create uh, errors. And the second example uh, refers to uh, a business rule, which basically says that with two employees with the same role in the company, the one uh, that is in NYC cannot um, have less salary than the one uh, elsewhere, because NYC is different. We all know that you know, it, you know everything there is different. So. The salaries in uh, New York cannot be uh, less than the salary that one make in uh, San Jose if they have the same uh, role in the company. Okay, um, but you know this is a general rule uh, that we can follow, and this might be like a valid. Uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, sometimes uh, this is not an error. This is an act an actual uh, salary of that person and this is like a valid violation of this business rule but like we need to you know um, keep in mind that sometimes this happen but still we need to review some general uh, rules to detect uh, these errors okay so and let's see what else we have Another uh, business rule says that two employees with the same role in the same city should earn about the same. So for example, this person uh, and this person, they have the same role. They are both in uh, New York City. One of them makes uh, 110, the other one uh, makes uh, 1,200. 
So what do we think? This is an error. And I would say this might have been 120. And this zero is just by mistake. Somebody just hit it twice. And uh, in the repair process, this is something that we can just, uh, just remove this uh, extra zero with a high level of confidence. Because once we remove it, um, the range is kind of uh, like they are both in the same similar range, okay? So, but this is something that, you know, uh, in the, in the uh, next step that we wanna talk about the repair, uh, there are different ways to repair the errors. Okay, um, so as I said, so this is like a, a two-step process. The first one uh, is error detection, and the second one is error repair. So once we detect all the errors, now it's time to find ways to uh, repair the errors. And this can be done um, par partially in an uh, automated way, but you know, it all depends on the case. Um, so in here you can see like this is the um, error detection. So first uh, we need to know the error type. So what we are detecting. So the error type is uh, the functional dependencies related to functional dependencies or related to the, um, I don't know what this is, conditional. Oh, I think this is conditional functional dependencies. And this one is um, denial constraint. What is a uh, denial constraint? Anybody has any guess? So um, a denial constraint is, it says that um, a set of uh, predicates cannot uh, be true uh, together for any combination of uh, tuples in uh, in a relation, like the, the two things that are contradictory cannot be uh, true. Okay, so for example, let's say um, one city like NYC cannot belong to two different states. So this is uh, what we call it a denial constraint. So these are the constraints that we put so that we can uh, detect the errors. Okay. Any questions so far? I hope I'm not going too fast or too slow. Just let me know if you have questions. Uh, anything in the chat? Okay, yeah. okay so then um, the, the second uh, step is uh, how to detect the, uh, the error. We have uh, automatic way and we have human guided ways and a combination of both. So most of the time we use uh, a combination of both, okay? And then the third step is where to detect it. Is there either it's in the source uh, or in the target, okay? And then in the data repairing, uh, so first we need to uh, know what to repair. So is Either it's a, the data we want to repair or the rules or both of them, like a combination of both. And then how to repair it, again, the same thing. Like um, most of the time it's like even uh, like, especially nowadays that, you know, we try to uh, make everything more automated. Uh, usually we use a combination of both, okay? And then, and then again, uh, where to repair it. So sometimes we repair it in place, like in the, uh, the data set itself. Like, as I mentioned, the previous example, we just see that, okay, this is 1,200, which should be like, if it was uh, 120, that would make, make it uh, correct. So we just repair it and, you know, change the values and that, that, that would uh, do the job, right? And repair it. But sometimes it's not that easy. We need to, build some models and then uh, fix the errors in the residuals of that model. Okay, and that's a different, uh, whole different story. 
um, so sometimes it's not easy to do uh, in place, okay? Um, okay, so basically, yeah, um, which errors to detect? So we, we partially covered that. We say that, okay, there are some, sometimes we have functional dependencies, um, which is like a city is related to a state. So if the state is not corresponding to that city, uh, that's when we detect the error. Or sometimes we have a, a data set that uh, lists all the movies, the title, and then once we see the title, the movie year should be there, and this corresponds to the uh, movie title. So when we see some errors in here, uh, we can just easily detect, right? And then we have um, conditional functional dependencies, which basically says um, X implies Y if P is correct, okay? That, and sometimes, you know, it uh, holds for the entire data set, and sometimes it holds only for a subset of uh, the, the data set. So we, we can just, you know, take that subset and, you know, put that uh, functional dependency and the constraints on that so that we can detect the error. So for example, if, uh, if we have a uh, data set for, um, that has so many countries in it and uh, so many addresses uh, to individuals, and then we know that you know, the zip code uh, employs the street number, uh, it's valid if the country is England. If not, then this, this is not true, okay? And so usually we uh, detect uh, these errors during the pre-processing phase, the con conditional fun uh, functional dependence, okay? And then uh, we have metric functional dependencies, which says uh, X in plus Y with an uh, error, okay? So, so for example, we, uh, we have um, two tuples with the same value of X, then the Y uh, values should be uh, very close within the same range, okay? So just like as uh, in that example, so in here it says about the person year uh, and uh, which employs the salary, but in that example was about the person and the role in the company and the salary should be uh, about the same range. So if it's not, then uh, we detect that error. But this is like with, a, with some margin of error, like it, it shouldn't be exactly the same um, salary. So it can be a little different, but you know, it has to be um, within a reasonably uh, close range. Okay, so yeah, this is the denial constraint that I explained. So this, uh, for example, in here, uh, a lower sal salary should have a lower tax rate if the location is the same. So let's look at the salary and the tax rate in here. Um, and if it's if we find something that um, the salary is lower but the tax rate is higher, then we know um, that there is an error in here. So let me see. Uh, do you see anything? Yeah, but so basically you, you get the idea. It's not, uh, I mean, you don't have to find it in here, but um, the idea is to, you know, two things that or uh, two things that are contradictory or a combination of them is contradictory uh, should not be there. If there is uh, such thing, we know that this is uh, an error. And there is this article very useful for you that I just linked, uh, you can uh, read. Very information. Okay. So um, 
many uh, okay so many other types of constraints or rule can be specified it depends on um, your data and you know the nature of the data and you know uh, because these are the qualitative uh, information and it's we need to know that this is like a very com complex uh, situation and uh, the more complex the uh, data and the more complex the constraint it's harder for you to check for it okay and um, it's like defining and putting the appropriate constraint itself and automate this process is by itself a very uh, critical part of the data cleaning okay so that's why i mean these are the reasons that we say that data cleaning takes, you know, um, 80 to 90% of your time because of all these complexities, okay? Okay, and um, how to check the errors? So it's pretty specific to the type of constraints that we have, um, but um, the thing is that there is no uh, specific software package that uh, I know of that can uh, do it for you. Uh, you might have to uh, write your own algorithm um, and do your own work, but so mm, this is something that you know makes it more complicated. So that's that's to the best of my knowledge. So if anybody knows any software packages that can um, help you automate the constraints uh, setting uh, process, you can just let the whole class know. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, where to check it? So this is the pipeline of uh, a certain data set and different uh, constraints that we said, they make sense at different points uh, in this pipeline, okay? So for example, uh, in here, uh, we put the constraint for the, uh, I mean, uh, this is the, I guess it's the, for the names. And we put the constraint for the name of the person. And we say, okay, if this is, um, I mean, this, this is and that, and then, you know, we just say that, okay, detect them as errors. And then um, at this stage in here, for example, it says the phone number must have a country code and a local number. This is the employee's uh, phone number. Uh, like it looks like a record of employees names and then their phone number and then at, at this stage we need to detect uh, if there's any error in the phone number and then at a, a higher uh, stage this data set looks like like there are different uh, shops and then different employees associated with the with all those shops and then for example, it says in the same shop, the average salary for the managers uh, should be higher than uh, the average salary for the staff, okay? So, and this is the uh, point where we put that constraint. And that is like, a looks like a business rule or something like that. Uh, that's when we put it there. So, because it's at the higher hierarchy uh, level, at this level, this employee level, we cannot put uh, such constraint, okay, right? So you see how uh, at different points in the uh, transformation pipeline, we, uh, we should put the constraints for detecting the errors, okay? Uh, and again, oh, um, so, so this is basically um, the uh, last slide before I jump to the next topic. Um, and um, 
so I just wanted to say like this, um, repairing the errors. So as you see, um, part of it uh, should be done manually, or you should at least uh, write your own code, uh, your own algorithm. And there has been a lot of research and efforts to automate uh, the error repair. And so basically there has been uh, methods that propose to find um, the minimal set of changes to make uh, to the data set so that there are no more errors, but it has not been uh, really practical enough um, because in error detection and error repair, repair uh, in the majority of the time, um, human some form of human verification is uh, required um, because you don't want to uh, repair an error and you don't make a new error so you don't you want to actually repair it uh, to the to the accurate uh, format otherwise there is no point uh, to do the error okay and uh, as always there is like um, this is when uh, you should build um, your uh, solution for the specific problem that you have. Sometimes um, uh, sometimes uh, the amount of automation is higher, sometimes it's lower. It's, uh, it depends on the problem, okay? So any questions on this? Okay. So um, the last topic for tonight is uh, entity resolution. And um, so there is this article which says, uh, called entity resolution tutorial. And uh, I will put it in the reference list for you. Uh, you can read it. So basically, uh, entity resolution refers to um, identifying uh, different uh, representations and manifestations of the same uh, real world object in the data sets. Okay. Uh, some of the examples are as follows like, for example, uh, one postal address could uh, belong to multiple people, like, uh, like either it's like a apartment complex that, you know, the same address for so many people or uh, a single family house that, you know, depending on the household size, one uh, single address uh, goes to uh, a few, like uh, more than one person, okay? And then the, the census records and, you know, um, sometimes you know identifying um, the same uh, companies in the financial records and um, you know so many other examples like okay uh, these uh, websites that um, you know do com comparison shopping uh, advices for you like they put uh, product one product and then they give you um, prices of that same uh, product in different uh, stores. So this is basically uh, one single entity in the real world, but um, you know you you can see different prices of it, different representation representation of it in different uh, stores. Um, and again, uh, in the citation data, you might see, um, like uh, one single author, author you, you will cite it uh, different uh, times in a uh, paper or article that you write, uh, but that's the same uh, person, but it, it has like um, a few, a few uh, published work of that person you will cite and that, that's when his or her name comes uh, in your list a few times, okay? Um, and also uh, another example is connecting of um, your bank accounts in online networks or either bank bank accounts or other accounts like social media accounts um, of the same person, but there are different uh, accounts uh, related to that person. 
um, so many uh, other examples. So we need to, um, you know, figure out the entity resolution. There are, uh, and these are um, other names that all of them refers to um, the same concept of entity resolution. So it's called record linkage, it's called uh, duplicate detection, uh, reference reconciliation, object consolidation, entity clustering, uh, household matching, reference matching, you know, all these names, they, they are used interchangeably for the entity resolution. It depends on the um, where, I mean, the context, okay? So, um, so these are just the names that you need to, you know, familiarize, familiarize uh, yourself with these names so that when you see any of these names, you know um, what they refer to, okay? They all refer to the same concept of um, entity resolution, okay? And it happens um, a lot in today's life. So one real life example so that you understand um, better the entity resolution. Um, in 2004, uh, Senator Edward Kennedy said that, oh, let me open it. Okay, so Senator Kennedy was uh, basically stopped uh, at the airport uh, five times in one month because uh, his name was similar uh, to another person who was like, for some reason, that person's name was uh, on a no-fly list and Senator Kennedy's name uh, was kind of similar or identical to that person. So basically anytime that he wa wanted to uh, check in in the airport, they stopped him and, you know, uh, make him waiting for a few hours just because of that, okay? So, um, and that, that uh, created so many discussions and, you know, uh, about this um, concept, right? And um, another uh, example that just came to my mind, uh, which is very similar to this one, is that, you know, um, I don't know how many of you are international students, but, um, those who are international students uh, might have gone through the uh, applying for uh, student visa to come to the US, right? And then they go to the agency and uh, they say, okay, your visa is uh, conditional upon the background check or the clearance or whatever they call it. And then they that process takes so many months and takes forever and, you know, then you might uh, follow up and ask, okay, why, why this is happening? What, what's wrong? What, I mean, what exactly are you checking in my background? And then it turns out that somebody's name was uh, exactly the same as yours. And that person was on a, like, I don't know, on a blacklist or something. And that would create uh, this long process of background check. So these are just uh, examples, right? Um, that all related to the uh, concept of um, entity resolution. And uh, so, as I uh, said, uh, one, uh, like these are the challenges. Like, um, so for example, as I said, we have um, two different names. Uh, we have one single name. Uh, in this case, we have uh, Tom Cruise. One is the famous actor. The other one is the British uh, soccer player. So basically, this is the same name, but in real world, there are, there are uh, these are the two person with the same name, but there might be more, but these are just the two uh, basically celebrities that we know of, but there might be so many more uh, Tom Cruise out there that we don't know, right? And the same with uh, Michael Jordan, um, two people with the same name. One is the famous uh, basketballist, the other one, um, I don't really know uh, this person, but this might be uh, another famous Michael Jordan um, that, uh, you know, these are the, the challenges related to um, the name, 
like similar name to uh, different uh, thing. Okay. The second challenge about uh, like in entity resolution is uh, errors that uh, we see due to uh, when we do the data entry. So, like sometimes you know um, there is problem with your handwriting or misspelling of, of something uh, that would create uh, problems. Like in here, uh, you see that uh, error in the data entry. Like these two should be the same, but because of an error in here, which has like an extra zero by error, that would make them different. Okay. And then uh, another challenge uh, happens due to uh, like missing values. Like sometimes, um, so for example, the some something is missing. Okay, but we need to put something there. Okay, um, so for example, if the name is missing, we can say uh, NK, like unknown, like non, not known, or we can say uh, not applicable or not known uh, or unknown, or we can just say ZZZ, you know, just uh, representing that uh, this name is missing or we don't know it. Okay, and if it's like different, like if we use uh, different representations for the same uh, thing, which in this case is our issue is missing value. So we don't know that value. So if we use different thing, the computer might treat them differently. But in reality, it's just because of that missing value. Okay. These are uh, the challenges in, uh, and Another challenge is changing the attributes. So for example, uh, this might happen in the, uh, so basically in some uh, time series data collection. So for example, you survey uh, somebody now and then you have to do a follow-up survey one month from now, two months from now, whatever. And then during this time, so first you collect uh, that person's uh, personal information, including their home address. But then uh, one month from now, that person has moved. And then once you ask, like you have to ask all those questions again so that you can uh, join the two data sets. And then you ask the home, ad home address and that person um, enters a different home address. Uh, basically that attribute has changed. But in reality, uh, that person is still the same. But uh, the computer might treat them as different or uh, it might give you an error, okay? Um, another case happens with uh, the data formatting, like for example, when we enter um, the date, uh, we can use different formatting, like uh, like this, like we can use the, um, so many different formattings representing the same date. But if we are not consistent across uh, two data sources that we are uh, linking or within the same data set, then uh, there is an issue, like the computer might not treat them as the same dates, all right? Um, and then uh, the abbreviations or data uh, truncation, like for example, sometimes you, you, you can use the entire um, word or you can use abbreviations instead. So if you use them interchangeably, then, you know, um, you don't treat them as um, the same uh, entity. So that would create uh, issues, okay? Okay, so and there are issues about the entity resolution in big data because big data uh, has, like is a whole different story, like, um, because of its uh, size, it's larger uh, than a regular data set. It has more uh, data points. It's like more heterogeneity across the uh, data points. And, you know, it's uh, sometimes the big data is unstructured, or, uh, unstructured and unclean. And, you know, sometimes it's uh, 
you know, it has diverse data types within the same uh, data set. So it all makes it so complicated and so complex that, you know, you need to use uh, more efficient uh, techniques to, um, you know, deal with the entity resolution with the, uh, with the big data. Okay. So, for example, in the big data, like uh, if it in a regular uh, spreadsheet, you need to match uh, name with name. In the big data, you might uh, not only you need to match name with name, you need to match the uh, names with the, um, their Amazon uh, profiles or their browsing history on Google or their uh, friends net network in Facebook. So this is something that makes it more complicated you might like if you mistakenly uh link one person for example name uh i don't know like uh john smith uh, and you link it to the wrong uh john smith facebook profile than the one that you really need then that that wouldn't give you the best um result right so that's why it makes the big data uh, entity resolution uh, challenges more difficult and more complex to solve. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, and the other uh, thing is that you know the in big data we see more uh, relationships, uh, and then we need to you know link those relationship uh, carefully and accurately, and then. Uh, the hierarchical process is uh, very uh, complicated. Like you need to, uh, so for example, you have uh, you have to deal with the structures of entities. Like you don't know if you should treat uh, Walmart and Walmart Pharmacy the same, or should you treat them different uh, entities, right? These are all the challenges and. Um, I would say that, um, you know, there is no uh, single correct answer for that question. It depends on the case. Like sometimes um, for your purpose, you need to treat uh, Walmart and ph Walmart pharmacy separate. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't really matter for your purpose. So, you know, there is no um, correct or incorrect answer for that. And uh, because the big data is a uh, multi-domain, it's you know you have to customize uh, your method to you know um, you know cover all the domains and you know um, all these uh, complexities. Okay. Uh, yeah. So in uh, entity resolution, when we do uh, the data cleaning, it's important to correctly identify the references because if you miss uh, the correct reference, then every other step that comes after is incorrect. So you need to know that you are you are um, pointing to the to the right uh, reference, like either it's like a person, a real world, or like a whatever that is, whatever entity uh, that is. Um, and then um, once you um, take action and you know once you clean up the data by uh, entity resolution it will show you um, a better structure of the data that may not be um, obvious and may not be uh, showing to you before before you uh, correct um, the data based on the entity uh, resolution but um, there are challenges for that, as I said, you know, uh, with the similar names that, you know, you might mistakenly treat uh, as different or uh, vice versa, or the postal addresses that change frequently, or sometimes we have um, like similar abbreviations uh, pointing to different entities, right? And these are all the challenges that, you know, it's very uh, complicated to fix. It's not, that's why that, um, you know, our approaches might be, our, our approaches should be very specific to the problem. And, you know, the way we deal, uh, deal with the missing values is different. Sometimes just um, 
by looking at the value, we know what's uh, what's incorrect and we can just easily correct it. Sometimes it's more complicated. Uh, we might decide to, you know, uh, remove that observation altogether. Um, so, no, so it all depends uh, on the case and you should be prepared to do a fair amount of uh, manual work in this process because otherwise, you know, you don't want to, as I mentioned, you don't want to um, repair something and then create another uh, error in the data because that would, that would not uh, be very good. Okay. Um, so, um, so now I'm showing so a few uh, examples of what I mean um, by all this. So for example, in real world, you have uh, these two uh, representatives and then in digital world, uh, you might have uh, multiple records of that uh, one single uh, entity, okay? So you need to distinguish, like, for example, you should say these three are different representations of this person and these four are different representations of uh, this person in the digital world. So it's kind of more complicated um, to identify uh, and link these, all of these, uh, you need to link in the digital world, it's more complicated because, you know, um, you have more records and so many um, data points that you need to link to the same entity. Um, and then uh, sometimes you need to link uh, records that match um, across databases. Like it's not uh, just uh, real world versus digital world. It's uh, across different data databases. Uh, you should be able to link correctly that, okay, this person and this person are linked and then these two and then these two are linked. Uh, and there are some attributes of them that you need to use as um, reference points so that you can uh, link them across uh, data points. So for example, in here, I guess um, both of these are um, smiling and they have glasses on. But, um, and then these two are linked because of their similar face expressions. You know, it, it depends on what attributes you um, choose to match uh, different entities and uh, records across uh, different databases. Okay. Uh, and then sometimes, uh, which happens in big data a lot, uh, is that you have a lot of noise in the data set and you need to uh, link the noisy records to the uh, the single representation of that uh, record uh, in a reference table. And then you need to know how to do it. Like in here, uh, it's very obvious and straightforward because um, we have only two in the reference table and then we have three and then uh, four related to this person. But it might get so complicated when we have uh, a large reference table and um, larger um, records in, in the uh, actual uh, big data, okay? Um, in uh, other cases, you uh, choose to cluster the records that uh, correspond to the same entity so that you can separate uh, them and you can deal with the um, the entity uh, resolution step, okay? So you cluster uh, these three in one cluster and these four uh, in the second cluster, and that would allow you to, you know, um, build all the other uh, steps based on, like for these clusters separately. So first you define the clusters, you put the matching uh, records into the um, their assigned cluster, and then you go from there.
so uh, so sometimes uh, once you uh, make the clusters and then you need to find uh, and or compute a cluster representative and you know it it might be very tricky because you want the representative to be um, like you, you, you want to find um, the most appropriate representative of that uh, record in the cluster. So it should be something that has um, similarities with all um, other records in the cluster. So finding the right uh, representative in the cluster is also uh, important. So these are uh, the things that, you know, we just um, um, give you an idea and a sense and then uh, later on in other courses, or maybe uh, some of these topics are covered more in depth in uh, this course, or 